Coming up, as cases of the coronavirus continue to increase across the country, your questions keep coming in. If only adults volunteer for the vaccine trial, then how will they know if it's safe for kids? We'll get you the answers, then we'll switch gears and pay a visit to the San Diego Zoo. This is Shaw, and he is a uh, spiny anteater, also known as an echidna. Find out more about these animals and what they've been up to just ahead. Plus, we'll introduce you to these inspiring teens from California who are on a mission to help kids. This is NBC Nightly News, Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. We're so glad you're joining us. I hope you and your families are safe and doing well this summer, despite all that's going on. So the virus outbreak continues to be our top story. Many states, including Louisiana, continue to see a rise in people getting sick from the virus. But some states hit hard in the spring, like New York, are seeing a decline in cases. The challenge, of course, is making sure that trend continues. Hey, we know school is probably on your mind as some school districts have already reopened. We're gonna have a lot on the subject of school coming up in our next few programs. Remember, we are here to help you try to understand all this, so let's get right to your questions. Joining us now, a familiar face, Dr. John Torres. Dr. John, our first question comes from Georgia. Hi, Hi Mr. Paul and Dr. John. My name is Leah. My name's Kim. And my name's Harry. And we live in Grayson, Georgia. My question is, if only adults volunteer for the vaccine trial, then how will they know if it's safe for kids? And my question is, if scientists um, make an, a vaccine that's effective and works for people, um, will it be able, will the coronavirus go away or will it at least be controlled? We love Kids Edition! Bye! And we love that you're watching. Thanks for the great question. Doc, what about it? You know, we love Kids Edition too, mainly because they come up with such great questions. And this one, the first part of the question is, how will we know the vaccine's safe for children? Well, we're gonna know that when they start testing it in children. But right off the bat, right now, they're testing it in adults, 18 and above. They wanna make sure it's safe and effective in that group for adults. Once they find out it's safe and that it's working, then they'll start looking at it in children and testing it in children to make sure it's safe for them as well. And that's when children will start getting it. So first off, you're probably gonna see adults getting it, especially adults that are much older or they have other health conditions. And then eventually, probably over a couple months, you'll see kids start to getting it, especially after they start getting tested with the vaccine. But as far as the vaccine, once we start getting it, will it start controlling the virus? Well, the virus will probably never go away. Think about the flu or measles. They don't go away, but we do control them with vaccines. We think the same thing will happen here, but enough people have to get that vaccine around the world and particularly here in the U.S. to make sure we can control the outbreak. Yeah, there's been a lot of exciting reporting lately about how close they may be to a vaccine, so we're all crossing our fingers. Our next question is from Texas. Hi, Dr. John. My name is Akshat, and this is my big sister, Lakshita, and we live in Texas. In our family, we take safety precautions and shower or change our clothes after coming from playing outside or visit any store. And our question is, do we always have to do that even though we wash our hands regularly and wear a mask? Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. All right. Thanks, guys, for the question. Dr. John, they're playing it extremely safe. Is it all necessary? You're right, Lester. They're playing it extremely safe. They're taking a lot of measures that they might not necessarily have to take. Now, when I work in the hospital, I'm around a lot of sick people, and those people we know have things like coronavirus. So when I go home to protect my family, I take off my clothes, I take a shower, wash my hands, make sure I do those things that are going to keep everybody safe. But if I just go out grocery shopping or I go outside, then I don't necessarily do all those things. I'll wear a mask, I'll wash my hands, and if I'm around a lot of people for long periods of time, especially if I think they might be sick, then I go ahead and change my clothes, but I don't necessarily take that shower. That might not be something you need to take all the time, but certainly it's something you want to take at least on a daily basis to make sure you, your family, and your community stay safe. Yeah, and I sure love the fact those kids are taking it very, very seriously, as they should. Our last one is a subject we have talked a lot about since the pandemic started. Hi, Lester Holt. My name is Shriyansh, and I live in Austin, Texas. My question is, is disinfectant effective against the coronavirus? Thank you. Now, Dr. John, there are a lot of disinfectants out there. How about them? 
there are a lot of disinfectants out there. And one of the things to remember is there's a difference between cleaners and disinfectants. Cleaners, they take off the stuff you can see, the dirt, the grime. They make sure that the table looks fine and looks clean. But disinfectants will kill the germs. And some disinfectants can kill coronavirus. But you want to make sure that the ones you're using can do that. So the best thing you can do is either you can go to the back of the disinfectant itself, and there's an EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, registration number. Then you can go to the EPA website, or you can go to their website with just the name of the disinfectant you're using and find out if it's approved against coronavirus. But here's one thing your parents probably don't even know about, and you can tell them and show them just how smart you are. If you look on the back of disinfectants, it'll tell you how long it needs to stay on the surface. In this case, it says the surface needs to be sprayed. You need to leave it there for 10 minutes before you wipe it off. Most of us aren't doing that right. We're spraying and wiping right away, but you need to make sure it stays on as long as the container says it needs to stay on in order to kill all those viruses. I am always learning something new from you. Dr. John, thanks very much. As you guys know, the pandemic forced zoos across the country to close for a while. Some have reopened, including the popular San Diego Zoo here in California. Joining us now is Rick Schwartz, the San Diego Zoo Global Wildlife Ambassador. Rick, great to have you on. Thanks for all you're doing out there. How have you guys gotten along during this pandemic? Uh, all things considered, we fared pretty well, and I wish you could be here today. I know we have to do a lot of stuff uh, social distance-wise, but if you were able to be here, you'd be able to see, see some of the animals up close and personal like our guests can. That's kind of what we want to share for you today. But overall, uh, sure, it was tough. We had we had to go through all the things everyone went through during the initial closure, but now we're open and we're happy to welcome guests back. All right. Now, I know you are in a special exhibit called the Walkabout Australia. Can you tell us what that's all about? Absolutely. We're actually at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, our sister facility, a little to the north of the San Diego Zoo. And we're at Walkabout Australia with, well, everything you can find in Australia just about. Uh, in fact, we're going to start off with one of the more interesting animals that people may not be aware of. It is uh, one of the rare egg-laying mammals uh, found in Australia. This is Shaw, and he is a uh, spiny anteater, also known as an echidna. They're the only living relative of the platypus, which also just happened to be residing uh, right back in the habitat area behind where Shaw is right now. But what's really unique about this species, aside from the egg laying side of things, when they're born, they come out of the egg, that little snoot you see there has a bunch of receptors, and that's how they can pick up the electric signals of body movement of the animals they're looking for, which is mostly grubs, bugs, and insects. Now, what about those needles? Are those like the ones we'd see on a porcupine? Well, they are sharp, yes, but they're not quite like a porcupine in the sense that a porcupine clues uh, will come out of their body when they go into the animal that is trying to eat them or attack them. Uh, Shaw would tuck up into a ball and use his feet to dig down and just become a bunch of very uncomfortable quills for the animal to try and eat. Yeah, and I know this is one of uh, the several ambassador animals you have there that people can interact with. What else do you have to show us? Well, right above my shoulder here, I can show you B. She is uh, one of our many marsupials we have. B is a, uh, a wallaby, and she's about six years old. So a lot of people have a hard time telling the difference between a wallaby and a kangaroo. And the easiest way is basically how, there's, how you spell it, honestly. Uh, but in all seriousness, they're in the same family. Uh, they're macropods. They have a lot of similar features. Uh, we do have a kangaroo here, so we'll go to that shortly to show you. But as you can see, Shaw is enjoying some leafy greens here. They are herbivores. And they do share a lot of similar attributes uh, as to what they fill in sort of in the ecosystem as the deer here in North America. They live in a group called a mob instead of a herd. Uh, it's mostly made of females and youngsters with a couple of males who are in charge of it, similar to a deer herd. And they eat a lot of the uh, grasses and low-lying shrubs for these animals. Of course, what's different is they hop and they have that beautiful pouch. Over the other side over here, we'll bring you over this way. We have a little bit bigger version of what you're just looking at. This is a red kangaroo, a female named Addie. She's about three years old. And you can see how she's holding on there with her front paws, uh, enjoying a little bit of her leafy greens. Now, a lot of people think all marsupials have pouches. Uh, that's a little bit misleading. Not all marsupials have pouches. But what a mar to be a marsupial basically means you were raised in a pouch, meaning only the females have pouches, not the males. Okay, now uh, I understand you've got a couple of platypus at the zoo, and that's pretty rare. Yes, uh, right here at Walkabout Australia at the Safari Park, we have the only two platypus you can find in North America right now. We do a lot of work in conservation all around the world, 
And one of the things we're doing is platypus conservation too. We're sponsoring a lot of the work, studying these unique animals that we don't really know a whole lot about. We're very fortunate through that work we're doing with Australia and the work that they're doing in Australia. Uh, in this building back here, we have housed behind us two platypus, the only two, like I said, you can see in North America right now. And before I let you go, for kids that can't make it to the zoo and, and the walkabout, do you guys have an online presence they can kind of interact with these creatures? Absolutely. Uh, it's one thing that was actually went out of control during the main closure of the pandemic. We have online cameras on our website, sandigozoo.org, and we have a lot of areas where kids can learn specifically, and we know it's, it's teacher-based, it's parent-safe, there's curriculum, there's coloring. Uh, we have a whole academy for high schoolers as well. So you go to sandigozoo.org, you'll be able to find all that great information, and if you want to come visit, information about your visit as well. All right, Rick Schwartz, great to talk to you. Thanks for introducing us to some of the, uh, the animals. It's always fun to, to, to learn more about them. So thanks very much. Well, thank you for having us. Have a good one. Okay. Finally, we want to introduce you to a group of inspiring girls from California who are helping kids color their way through the pandemic. It all started as a school project. I don't think any of us expected it to be this big and this successful. High school freshmen Lauren, Ella, Sophia, and Aaron turned their economics homework of creating a business plan into a reality by publishing the COVID coloring book. We have coloring pages and then activity pages and all of them. It narrates the story of Ali Gator and Wally the Narwhal and Sam the Snail teaching kids about coronavirus and how to be safe during this time. You're kind of learning and coloring at the same time, so it's pretty fun for the kids. A mission that's not only helping kids, but charities too. So far, the girls have donated $12,000 of proceeds to organizations across the country, blossoming their friendship built on kindness. It's not like any other group project, like we're good friends and we can rely on each other to do stuff. Some people say it's not really work when you're having fun, and it's kind of like that for us. And the fun is just beginning. The classmates have a second coloring book coming out soon. This one focuses on race in America and discrimination. The main purpose of all our books is just to create a kid-friendly perspective on these issues. I think coloring while reading about it makes it so much better because they're having fun. A business plan with no plans of stopping anytime soon. Great job, girls. Well, that's going to do it for us. Parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question about going back to school or wants to share their thoughts or concerns, send a video to us at nightlynewskids at NBCUni.com. Thanks for watching, everybody, and please continue to take care of yourself and each other.